share with you in worship this morning. It's a, it's a lovely privilege, and uh, I don't know a lot of you personally, but uh, one of them, one of you, it has been my mentor for many years, and uh, I'll leave you to guess as to who that might be. Uh, we'll open with uh, uh, our passages for this morning, and I'm going to read, first of all, from Exodus chapter 13, and I'll read verses 3 to 10, and then verse 14. So if you'd like to follow along, I believe the, the uh, passage, yes, it's going to be on the screen, but you might want to follow along in your pew Bibles. And uh, I think the directions or the page numbers are in your bulletins. So uh, we start with Exodus 13, uh, verses 3 to 10, and then 14. Moses said to the people, Remember this day on which you came out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, because the Lord brought you out from there by the strength of hand, no leavened bread shall be eaten. Today, in the month of Abib, you are going out. When the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Hevites, and the Jebusites, which he swore to your ancestors to give you, a land flowing with milk and honey, you shall keep this observance in this month. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh there shall be a festival to the Lord. Unleavened bread shall be eaten for seven days. No leavened bread shall be seen in your possession, and no leaven shall be seen among you in all your territory. You shall tell your child on that day, it is because of what the Lord has done did for us, or did for me, when I came out of Egypt. It shall serve for you as a sign on your hand and as a reminder on your forehead, so that the teaching of the Lord may be on your lips. For with a strong hand the Lord brought you out of Egypt. You shall keep this ordinance at its proper time from year to year. And then down to verse 14. When in the future your child asks you, what does this mean? You shall answer, by strength of hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt from the house of slavery. And then turning to the letter of Peter, uh, the second, second letter, so, second Peter, and the very first chapter, and I'll be reading verses 12 to 15. Therefore, I tend to keep on reminding you of these things. Though you know them already and are established in the truth that has come to you, I think it right, as long as I am in this body, to refresh your memory, since I know that my death will come soon, as indeed our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. And I will make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall these things. So as we prepare, will you join me in a, in a prayer of preparation using the very familiar words of the psalmist. Let the words of my mouth and the thoughts of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, you know that, maybe you don't know, but today in the worldwide Christian church. Today is the day that uh, the church has for centuries and centuries celebrated ascension, this bodily ascension of Jesus after his resurrection. We as Baptists don't really give much credence to this uh, day, 
Uh, but from my own uh, family's history, my mom often reminds me that when she was growing up in Manitoba, she came from, uh, she was uh, within the Mennonite church, that day was a holiday. It wasn't uh, the kind of holiday we might typically celebrate because they went to church. Uh, so uh, uh, Ascension Day is actually on Thursday. So this past Thursday was Ascension Day and uh, schools were closed and the family went to church. Um, so today is Ascension Day and I would like to just acknowledge that because that's part of, uh, in the Apostles' Creed, we always uh, say that he ascended and sits, at the, Jesus ascended and sits at the right hand of God the Father. But it's not something that we often focus on or preach on. Now, after all of that build up, I'm not going to preach on it. Uh, uh, because it, it, it is a rather difficult kind of concept uh, to, to, to deal with. And I just didn't have the time to, to really work at it, but to, do, to acknowledge it. This morning, rather, I'd like to reflect, uh, invite you to reflect with me on the significance in your life of the Lord's Supper, or Holy Communion, which we will be celebrating together later on. In most Baptist churches, it's something we do every month. That means for those of you who grew up in the church, who might have been participating in communion for, let's just say, 40 years, perhaps you've been um, a Christian for 40 years, and so for 40 years you've been celebrating communion. That would be 480 times, plus or minus. Now for someone who belongs to, let's say, an Anglican or a Lutheran church, those 40 years would amount to over 2,000 times, because they observe it every Sunday. Now that's a lot of times doing something that is supposed to be profoundly significant in one's faith life. It's, we could call it a ritual or an act or an event, but we're commanded to do it regularly, to remember God's saving acts toward us and for us. And that's why I chose to read the passages from Exodus and Peter, which might at first not seem to be so immediately connected. Without the memory of this event, I suggest that we can lose our identity. God was very specific in his commands to Moses that that saving act of, of their delivery from bondage, from slavery, was to be commemorated and remembered every year. And that information, the explanation, was to be passed down from generation to generation. When your child asks you, we read, then you say, the Lord delivered us by his mighty hand. And Peter, too, that emphasis on remembering, on reminding, on refreshing our memory. Think of the long-suffering history, for instance, of the Jewish people. Through exile, through pogroms, even genocide, they've kept their their faith and their identity by one of the ways they've done that by faithfully observing Passover every year and remembering that it was the Lord who brought them out of Egypt and then subsequently could bring them then through whatever troubles they were presently enduring. If you went to church membership classes or Sunday school as a child, maybe you had a lesson on this on its meaning. On, on the meaning of communion. You probably know the story of Jesus' last supper with his disciples on the night he was betrayed by, by Judas, and we will probably be reading those words of institution as we participate and as we prepare. And every time you participate, those familiar words of St. Paul, who was uh, teaching the church at Corinth about this practice. It had already become an established practice just decades after Jesus' death. And in the 11th chapter of 1 Corinthians, we discover that the purpose of Paul's writing about communion and explaining it, 
was to address major abuses that were occurring. And he certainly didn't mince words. Uh, I'm going, in verse 17, and I'm going to read from Eugene Peterson's version because it's so uh, strong. Regarding this next item, Paul writes, and that means communion or the Lord's Supper, I'm not at all pleased. I'm getting the picture that when you meet together, it brings out the worst side of you instead of your best. Imagine. And then he goes on to give them the straight goods on how they should approach the Lord's Supper. Peter too reminds us to refresh our memory and to recall these things. But this morning, I don't particularly want to give you a history lesson about this, um, this defining observation in our Christian faith, but to explore how it might re enrich your lives if we allow it to. I've discovered a book that's challenged me to think through my own approach to the Lord's Supper. It's, uh, the book's title is The Sacred Meal by Nora Gallagher. I'll be quoting from her through the, through the rest of my sermon. First of all, I'd like to ask you, have you ever had a memorable spiritual experience during communion? or participated in a communion service that touched you deeply. I want to share one, one particular um, experience that I've had. Years ago, the deacons in the church I was attending had a communion service on New Year's Eve at 11 o'clock, so it was fairly late. As you might expect, the attendance wasn't very large, Oh, I, although I was surprised how many people did come out. The church was lit only by candles. Soft music was playing, and the focus was entirely on communion, no sermon. And there were significant periods of silence. The bread and the cup were served at the table by the deacons, and we were invited to take our time at the table for a moment of reflection if we wished. We were also asked to reflect on what we wanted to let go of from the previous year and what significant spiritual gift we, were, uh, we wanted to ask God for for the coming year. Those things we wanted to discard, we actually wrote on a piece of paper which we took to the table and then burned in a suitable metal pail. The pace of the service the lack of visual distractions in the soft light, and the bodily involvement of getting up and going to the table to accept the bread and, and cup personally from a fellow member who, who then offered a special blessing. They all made that service especially powerful and a highlight, a spiritual highlight for me. Christ seemed to be present in a tangible way. However, it might not always be that profound, especially as we do it month after month, year after month, uh, after year. I can identify with Nora Gallagher who writes, sometimes it is for me a perfectly ordinary event, but sometimes it's as if the floor dropped out from underneath my feet. While it's unrealistic, I think, to expect the floor to drop out from under our feet every time we partake of communion, I believe we should ask ourselves, what should we expect from the act of taking communion? What should we expect from God, from ourselves? As members of that group of Christians who practice believer's baptism, we're reluctant to use the word sacrament to describe the Lord's Supper. Since we don't hold to that uh, Christian doctrine that's shared with some of our uh, brothers and sisters in Christ from other denominations, who uh, believe that consuming the bread and wine, which has been consecrated specifically for this purpose, actually conveys God's grace in an extraordinary way. We tend to view it as a remembrance. We often use that terminology, 
and we call it an ordinance, from that word meaning to command or to be ordered. By using that language, I wonder if we haven't lowered our expectations of this event. It becomes mainly a head thing, a mind thing. You know, the pastor uses words and concepts that aren't part of our daily language or, or da daily conversations. Covenant, sacrifice, salvation. And so we kind of relegate it to that corner of our life labeled religion. Our hearts might be kind of left out sometime. It was different in the early church, you know. Then the Lord's Supper was part of sharing a communal meal with people from all walks and stations of life. So many of the, of the events recorded about Jesus' life, and indeed the stories that he told himself involved meals. In Gallagher's words, you would think, given the number of times we hear a parable about eating in the Gospels, that Jesus might have, been, might have moonlighted as a food critic. But in his day, and still in many parts of the world today, sharing a meal together, breaking bread, was a profound act in itself. It represented life and sustenance, community and hospitality. We've divorced this observance from lived experience, reduced it to a nibble and a sip, which we can take without even making eye contact with the person who is handing the plate to us. However, I want to, uh, to uh, emphasize the importance of the symbol itself. Roy Oswald describes uh, rituals as habits made holy. And another author I'm fond of, she uh, explains symbols, you know, the bread and the cup, the cross and other symbols around our life as physical or observable things, physical things, that we use so that our eyes can remind our hearts. Both ritual and symbol become powerful when they remind us of a deeper unseen truth. This Christian practice is so rich we could write books about it, and indeed many books have been written. In these few moments, I can only focus on a couple of implications it has for our understanding of God's grace and the way we live our daily lives. So there are a few points I'd like to bring to your attention. First of all, Holy Communion is for everyone. This statement flies in the face of some denominational doctrines and even of a few Baptist churches. I realize I'm treading on thin ice here, <clears throat> but I've come to believe strongly that God's hospitality is much wider than our own. And I don't come to this position out of personal preference, just because I want to be nice to everyone. As I read the Gospels closely, I see that Jesus was pretty indiscriminate about whom he sat down to table with. Jesus loved an open table. He broke bread with prostitutes, hated tax collectors, day laborers, and outcasts, as well as the rich, the professionals, and the political readers, leaders. Jesus practiced a radical faith. Everyone was welcome at his table. Think about the story of the feeding of the 5,000, for instance. Jesus didn't ask those thousands of people camped on that hillside whether they had confessed their sins or how clean they were. He fed them. This table is especially for those who are hurting or confused or needy because it is a physical reminder of the wideness of God's mercy. In his letters, uh, this book, Letters to a Young Evangelical, Tommy Campolo, Tony Campolo, shares a story from his youth that expresses this vividly. I find it a very powerful story. And so he writes, 
Sitting with my parents at a communion service when I was very young, perhaps six or seven years old, I became aware of a young woman in the pew in front of us who was sobbing and shaking. The minister had just finished reading the passage of scripture written by Paul that says, Whomever, whosoever shall eat the bread and drink the cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. As the communion plate with its small pieces of bread was, was passed to the crying woman before me, she waved it away and then lowered her head in despair. It was then that my Sicilian father leaned over her shoulder and in his broken English said sternly, Take it, girl. It was meant for you. Do you hear me? She raised her head and nodded. And then she took the bread and ate it. And I knew then, at that moment, some kind of heavy burden was lifted from her heart and mind. Since then, I have always known that a church that could offer communion to hurting people was a special gift from God. It's the end of the quote. If we open the Lord's table to everyone, what does that mean for our individual day-to-day -day lived lives? Do we live out radical hospitality in our homes, in our churches? My parents modeled that for us. Over their lifetime, the, both of them, but especially my father, brought many people into our home for a meal, maybe for an overnight stay or for extended periods of time. And everyone was treated like family. They included young people struggling with depression or a difficult home life or even thoughts of suicide, alcoholics, criminal offenders, as well as university profess uh, presidents, denominational leaders, and others. The longest staying was the wife of an offender who lived with them for 11 years and became another daughter to them and a sister to me and my sisters. She had just come for a month to stay until she could find a place, and she ended up staying 11 years. Now, I'm not suggesting that everyone is called or able to practice that type of hospitality, but all of us, I suggest, are called to extend kindness and acceptance to all whom we encounter in our daily lives without judgment. What do we really think of the person in the neck, pew next to us as we pass or accept the plate from him or her? As Jesus sat at dinner with one of the religious leaders of the day, he told a story that bluntly reminded them that the humble would be exalted and the proud would be humbled at God's table. Participating in this meal often afford, also affords us time for quiet reflection, which is increasingly rare in our busy and often hectic lives. In fact, one theologian has written, in the distracted digital age, it may be the case that the classical debates about the presence of Jesus Christ in the Lord's Supper have been inverted. The question with which we may have to wrestle is not in what way is the Lord present in the Supper. Instead, the question should be, in what way are we present? I must admit, oftentimes, you know, as, as we walk through, as we um, participate in the Lord's Supper, and you know, there's that period of waiting as the plate comes and as everyone is served, my mind is racing with all kinds of things, urgent issues that need, need to be addressed, all distractions of the day. Instead of taking those few precious moments to reflect on Christ's immeasurable gift of love. It's hard to get out of our self-absorbed ruts, 
But what an opportunity the Lord's Supper affords us to meditate on what God has accomplished for us through Christ and what a liberating, joyful truth that is. And to quote another author writing about the celebratory side of communion, this table is different. This table of the Lord isn't where sinners find Christ, but where sinners celebrate being found. Maybe some morning, instead of solemnly passing these trays, we should dance for joy. Maybe we should sing every born-again song we know. Maybe we, maybe we should tell our homecoming stories and laugh like people who no longer fear death. Maybe we should ask if anyone wants seconds and hold our little cups high to toast lost sisters found and dead brothers alive. The abundant life. The early Christians got it. As we read in the book of Acts, they bro broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all of the people. So I'm going to tell you just a little story that it's kind of funny, and uh, I don't know if it really fits in, but it, I just had to find a place for it. And this is also about communion. A four-year-old was in church when the bread and wine were passed out. So he's four years old, and his mother leaned over and told him that he was not old enough to partake in communion. Then later, when the collection plate came by, his mother again leaned over and tried to coax a, a nickel out of his clenched fist. But he held firm and shouted, if I can't eat, I won't pay. So rather than sharing, the, uh, so sharing this meal calls us to unclench our fists to respond with glad and thankful hearts. In fact, one of the names for this meal is Eucharist, which comes from a Greek word meaning thanksgiving. And if we want to know what a joyful feast feels like, we need to participate perhaps with children as they, uh, you know, in my own home church, uh, as they pray, you know, for a friend who, whose puppy is sick or whose grandmother has passed away. It might mean visiting a, uh, a prisoner or a shut-in, or helping out at the food bank, or sharing the hope of your faith with a troubled co-worker. It might be looking out for your children's friends and creating a welcoming atmosphere for them. It might mean giving some of your time to a Sunday school or a youth program or providing support for those programs. Or, most challenging of it all, it might mean loving the difficult member of your own family. It always means letting go of selfish preoccupations and discovering the freedom and richness of living in God's economy. So as we share the Lord's Supper with each other this morning, I hope that it will be a joyful event for you and that it touches the deepest core of your being with the reality of God's radical hospitality and acceptance. You're all welcome at his table where you will glimpse the abundant life Christ offers. And may it then encourage you to share that profound reality with those in your family or neighborhood. So let's remember and celebrate.